having sat in loads of pitch sessions um, where there's my clients on one side and startups will come in and pitch on the other. If someone said to me now, what's the biggest uh, reason why the startup that should have won the business didn't get it? It's it's either because they are slightly late for the meeting or when they pitch, they over pitch. So they don't keep to the timings of the session. So if the session is 15 minute pitch, 15 minute Q&A, they will pitch 25 minutes. And so if you're a startup, a founder, go and see a corporate, some founders will think this is the million dollar check. This is going to, if this goes well, this is me working now for Coke or Adidas or someone. And they tell all their friends that they've got a meeting about Adidas. So they put all this pressure on themselves that this is going to be the big groundbreaking day. And then even if it all goes right and they get a piece of work, Adidas, I assume, are not going to turn around and say, here is five million pounds for some work. Give us your bank details. Mm-hmm. It works the other way for corporates. I say to corporates, you're not going to meet the new Snapchat, Facebook overnight, and double your revenue because we've introduced the next big thing. Because if we could do that, it'd be amazing. But yeah. we're not, you know, no one could do it. It's, it's, it's a lot of luck. If you've got your head up looking around, you see opportunity. If you keep your head down looking at your laptop, you won't. Welcome to another episode of Big Risk Energy. And on this episode, I'm blessed to be joined by the one and only Ken Validy. Ken is the co founder and partner of Progressive and also the author of The Startup Lexicon. Ken, thank you so much for joining. My pleasure. Great to be here. Really looking forward to it. So as I was saying to you just before, you very kindly sent me a copy of The Startup Lexicon uh, probably about two months ago now. Yes. And it's sitting very, very proudly on my bookshelf next to next to the real canon of you know startup literature out there. And uh, you're very much firmly alongside all the greats. So uh, thank you for sending it over. Well, thank you for doing that. My goodness. Yeah. So yeah. as we were just saying before, so mm. I've been a founder for 11 years now. And one of the most prohibitive things for me as an you know, first time founder, very, very green. But sometimes you go into a room with amazing people and you've worked so hard to get into that room and you've, you know, knocked Mm. on every door and you've made your pitch deck look the best it can and then you'll get thrown by some terms, Mm. which um, can absolutely blindside you because especially as a first time founder, you don't want to look like you don't know what you're doing. So you might respond to that term. How how did you get to to start writing this? I it, it started nine years ago, believe it or not. So when I left the corporate world to start my own business on my own initially, I I went into lots of meetings with founders. I went to lots of mentor meetings um, as part of accelerators, and I was I was quite a confident chap. I thought I can I can nail this, do my own business. I wasn't arrogant, but I was confident, and I was just blown away by the language. I thought from the corporate world had its own language. My goodness, all the terminology in the corporate world, which drove me mad. I thought no way could the startup world have this, but the startup world's worse. Yeah. So I sat there in the first meeting or one of the first meetings and people were talking about road, roadmap, run rate, burn rate, series ABC, convertible notes. And I thought, my goodness, what is happening? It, you know, flights and paths. And I thought, what is happening here? So I kind of winged it. If I'm honest, I kind of smiled and nodded and, and in, in fairness, I didn't need to know the detail and the definition behind all of them, but I just looked like I did, but it did, knocked me a bit. I thought, is this right for me? Now, I didn't at the time, I wasn't pitching something. I didn't have, you know, a lot on the line in those meetings. But I know that since that first two or three meetings, I, I sensed a lot of people in the same boat. They may not admit to it, but they go into big meetings and they would be thrown by certain questions. And sometimes that question, the thing that's thrown them is, is the terms that are used in that question. So I asked around a few people and realised, thank God that I wasn't the only person who was like that. But it was kind of a, you know, a a secret that was out in the open where people were struggling with these words. And I had this idea of putting these words together and doing some kind of book. And then life got in the way, the the, the business grew. I, I, I then started Progressive back in 2017. And then during COVID, uh, my wife, who's forgotten she said this, we were in uh, the lounge one day and she just mentioned whatever happened to that book idea. And I thought, hmm, I, what happened to that? And it was on a hard drive. So I had like 50 or 60 words on a hard drive. And I opened it and I thought I should do this. But I realised I couldn't do it on my own. So I did it with a, a really great chap called Eamon Kerry, who used to head up Textiles in the UK. And we did it together. So we pulled the startup Lexington together. Um, and that was good. It, most of it was done virtually over COVID, just after COVID. But it, it was one of those moments where it felt the right time to do it. But the reason to do it really was to help, as you say, to help people get out of those situations where they're out of their comfort zone. They're asked a question. There's a lot of pressure on how they answer that question. And I'm not saying the book is a panacea for helping you in all those situations, but it's a good primer to help founders understand some of the basic terminology they will get asked. Or if, even if they don't understand the depth of a definition or a word, they understand roughly what it means. So that it gives them much better, should we say, resource to, to answer the question properly. Yeah. And I, I do feel a lot of 
founders, maybe especially female founders sometimes who, you know, I'm very passionate about that, want to start a business, in some cases feel that they're not good enough to start a business. There's this kind of imposter syndrome. And I feel they can go into, um, you know, female founders can go into meetings, but it can be predominantly men. And there's always terminology being thrown around. And I know a few female founders who have come out and thought that was almost I was going to pack it up then. Mm-hmm. Because I just, I, I felt a little bit insecure and, you know, as I say, imposter syndrome before the meeting. And then after listening to this new language, I definitely thought it wasn't for me. But luckily the ones, these ladies carried on. But so it wasn't written necessarily for female founders, but it was written for founders generally or anyone who works with startups to um, have an appreciation. There is a language. It's always evolving and it's worth their while getting a primer and an understanding of those words that are going to come up. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's such a, a amazing purpose-driven project in that way because it is about leveling the playing field, mm. right? You know, you can be uh, an amazing technologist, an amazing marketeer. You might have just all that hustle and grit that yeah. the founder needs to have, but something is being, you know, out of network, out of education, however you want to call it, out of information uh, and knowledge uh, can be so prohibitive in that way. Absolutely. I mean, if I'm honest, there were some words when Aim and I sat down over a Google Doc and went through these words and did the definitions with the our publisher and editors and everything. Um, there were certain words I didn't know the definitions to, and Eamon was better suited to, to, to write the definitions and, and vice versa. There were certain words that the definition was different to what I thought it was. Interesting. So I thought, oh, I d-, and I, there was one agile. I never realised that agile was actually a methodology. Mm. It was, I, d- I just thought it was agile being kind of you know quick, flexible. Yeah. I thought, my goodness, I didn't know this. Yeah. Um, and we had other, I would say, uh, established people within the ecosystems coming to us saying, oh, I got the book. I never realised that meant that. I always thought it meant that. So in what was initially a book to help new first-time founders, uh, in a bizarre way, I think it, it kind of helped bring everyone up to speed with certain words and, and kind of reset as to what yeah. those words mean. I'm not saying I'm, I'm not the god of what these words mean, but when you people were just getting the definitions wrong from the start and they live with that. It's so interesting. And I think that does uh, speak a lot to maybe some of the ego that you see within these circles that you probably have two very, very experienced people having a conversation using the same terminology with totally different understandings of what that word means, but, you know, agreeing and and nodding along to that point. Yeah, absolutely right. And uh, yeah, it's very, you know, we're we're writing a second edition uh, next month. So we've already got, and we've got to work out the exact number, but I've already noted about 70 words. Mm that need to go into the new edition. So it's not just a one-stop shop book. It's going to evolve. The language evolves. Um, so hopefully there'll be a volume three, four, five, but it's already in a year since the book came out. And there's loads of words, generative AI, chat GPT, that need to go into the book. Really, really interesting. And which words, uh, this is a bit of a, it might be a tough question to yeah, ask, yeah, but yeah, yeah. what are the most common words that you see founders getting um, caught on? I think one one that always, and I, I've, I'm not an expert on it, but one, convertible notes always kind of comes up mm-hmm. um, as to the meaning and the, the benefit. There's some other words that people take for granted, like sweat equity. Mm-hmm. People from both sides, the, the, the founder and the person in the, offering the service, sometimes sees a positive of both sides, but there's a negative. So sweat equity kind of had a, a lot more consideration to it than maybe people, people thought it had as, as, a, as an option. And um, if there's any other ones that I think came up that not necessarily through people, but people are tr- quite intrigued by his bridge round, down round, yep. very, um, very relevant typical, in yeah, times yeah. now. And um, Eamon and I, we did a podcast series with the book as well, and we had a long discussion about, I think it was um, down round, mm-hmm. and saying it's actually, in a bizarre way, it's quite a positive thing, because to actually be, as a founder, honest and open that, you know, you, you, things aren't as good, but you want to push on and, and you know, you need to, to, to move on and keep the momentum going. Bridge around the same, mm-hmm. rather than saying it's going to be fantastic, let's just get more money. That honesty um, is actually a good thing for the long for the long run, you know, with not only with the investors, but also with yourself. So Interesting. so it got quite deep on those ones. Bridge round, down round was quite deep conversations. Convertible notes was one that always comes up. And mm-hmm. then someone's like, sweat equity was thrown around a bit. People mm-hmm. saw it in different ways. Yeah, nice. Okay. Yeah. And I think... One of the really important things to be very honest about to early stage founders listening to this mm. is why is it important to have this language, um, you know, something that you're really au fait with? And I think from my perspective, call it a necessary evil, call mm. it whatever you want, mm. but understanding VC, not just in terms of the terminology, but understanding the mindset, understanding the um, appetite for investment, understanding the the 
sort of requirements of a return mm. is a necessary part of this game. Mm -hmm. And often I have seen VCs almost purposefully using as much jargon as possible to test whether that founder understands the game or not. Mm. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I mean, I, I, I can understand it. I don't necessarily know if I agree with it. Um, I think <clears throat> I'm, I'm not from a VC background, but I think at the end of the day, whatever relationship we have with someone, you've, you've got to build that partnership with them. And I think if you're going into it with a with that attitude at the start, I, I question whether that's a good approach. Whether that changes afterwards if the founder passes all the, mm -hmm. ticks all the boxes and then the VC then opens up more. But it doesn't surprise me. Um, I don't think there's a kind of a... We haven't got a book out called you know, Terms to Know When a VC Asks You Questions, but it's another reason why I think the book helps. Mm. Um, I mean, there's 200 plus words in there, so I'm not asking it. It's definitely not a, um audio book out yep. there because you would fall asleep if you listen from <laughs> A to Z. But it's it's flicking through. We've had a lot of feedback from people that people like to pick it up, they look through it, or if they've been in the meeting and there's a word, they have a quick look at the book, or they look online as a Kindle version, etc. And, and they just have it. It gives them that kind of... It's a bit like having your a little bit of a buddy in your pocket that can, that can mm. help you out and you just, just feel comfortable with, with where things are going or what words have been said. So I, I don't think it's a revision document as such, but the feedback we've had is people pick it up and use it quite a lot for reference. And over time, it's definitely led to people looking at a word and then looking at more um, written content around that word. So it's a start, yeah. it's a primer. It starts off and then you can go on that. So if you want to learn more about down rounds, bridge rounds, convertible mm. notes, series A, B, C, whatever it may be, you get some, the understanding from the book and then you might read some blogs about it or people you know, having interviews about it. So it starts mm. you off. But at least when you see further content, you understand what the phrase means and what the word means rather mm. than just obliviously going into loads and loads of content and not really understanding it from the start. Yeah, huge difference. Yeah, huge it's difference. a huge difference. And I think it gives people confidence to be more curious and to find more content. Um, so yeah, we've had some really good good feedback. And it's, uh, yeah, it, it's one of those things we always wanted to do and um, just life got in the way for a few years. Yeah. I, well i think it's a, a really amazing tool for founders on that way so um yeah big congrats on putting it out but you've worked with founders in lots of capacities uh not just in terms of educating them this way you've also uh, it's been a big part of progressive uh working with startups you've also done tons of mentoring work i remember when we first spoke a few months ago i, yes. just, I couldn't believe how many places you, you had given your yep. time so generously to so w what does that journey look like for you and, and why did you start working with startups in that way well i was i was a corporate Guy, really, up until almost ten years ago, I was I was a brand person. So I'm, I'm deep down, I'm still a brand person. So I, I used the last company I worked for was Einhouse Bush InBev, the big global brewer. I did a few brand director roles there. I was a UK brand director for Bex, the German beer. And then my last job at AB InBev, I didn't know it was my last at the time, but my my last job was obviously is a funny old title. It was a consumer connections director for Western Europe, wow. <laughs> which literally meant I had a team in that zone where we went around to all the different brand teams and really started from scratch all their digital strategies because this was a time when social media was coming to the surface and we had certain brands with four Facebook pages that right. no one was aware of this kind of thing. So we're a bit like internal for internal police really going around and, and starting from scratch with all these brands. And that was fantastic. Um, it was good in one way that it opened my mind to a new world. Uh, it was a lot of traveling. Mm -hmm. But in that period, we used, I used to go um, on a Euro Star every week to Leuven, which is just just uh, it's just outside Brussels, where the head office of ABI was. And Thursday night was the night of all the British people went back from Brussels back to St Pancras. And I picked up a magazine and I saw about the Shoreditch um, startup scene. I thought that's that's quite interesting. So I started to meet some startups, and that was that kind of sliding doors moment. I met mm. three or four startups, all of them fantastic. And I, I just thought. Things hit me straight away. One, they're so positive, so vibrant, so forward-thinking, so so just literally full of enthusiasm. And it made me feel quite old and staid. Uh, I thought, well, what have I been doing? You know, I mean, you, you can... These corporate careers are fantastic, and, it, and don't get me wrong, it's, it's a good thing. But it made me realise I was at a crossroads and maybe didn't realise it. And initially, I tried to get some startups into ABI to work with some of the brand teams. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with some success, but it was tough. One, because I had a day job. So to try and do this on top of the day job was very difficult. And two, it wasn't just a case of A, meet B, you should work together on this, and it happens. People are busy, there's different cultures. And it, it, it really opened my eyes to the fact that this wasn't an overnight job. And and I had one of these moments where, um, I don't know why, I just thought it needs to be someone in the middle to do this. I can chat to people. Why don't I just do it? So I, I jumped the corporate ship, uh, say, almost 10 years ago. And initially was the person on my own between the corporate world and startup world. So I'd get briefs from the corporate world. It could be a marketing brief. 
and I would go and build a network from scratch to find out what's out there in the startup world and eventually try and join the two to work together. Mm. That's how basic it was. So I spent all my time around Shoreditch initially meeting startups, trying to convince people that I, I was... Um, I was credible. Yeah, I wasn't yeah, just yeah. a corporate guy who was <laughs> trying to be cool and things like that. Um, and it took time, but roll forward with Progressive now, as Matt and I run the business, and, and I do exactly the same thing within Progressive. So we, we I'm, I'm like a connector between the corporate world and the startup world, and we do lots of what we call rise and scans for corporates who want to know what's out there in a certain area mm. before they meet startups. But we also do the brief right through to pilot mm. um, with corporates. So, yeah, so I, I've, I've always been a kind of a connector um, and I, I've kind of, I really thrive in that that middle spot. But on the mentoring side, I think that's the that's the most enjoyable part of the job. And I've done that from day one. I was very lucky to mentor on Techstars right from the start, mm. which is a great place to start. And and I've mentored on quite a lot of programs. If anything, I, I try and keep it down to three or so because it does take time, and I want to do it properly. So, um, but I've really enjoyed that. I think it's if you've got a long week, and you see, a, I always see an hour as a mentor slot. I think I look really look forward to that meeting because there's no pressure on that. I can sit down, listen to someone's um, current situation, and hopefully help them. And I, I, I mentor uh, people in all different areas. Yeah, mostly just to listen and give some advice. I don't, I don't say much really. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's uh, thank you so much for sharing that, by the way. And, and a couple of things come to mind. But I totally agree with you on the mentoring side. Mm. And what I find is often when you're speaking to early stage founders mentorship and therapy are you know yeah. there's, there's a pretty there's a pretty thin line between the two but being able to come from a position of you know not having emotion when it comes mm-hmm. to looking at a problem which is very difficult to do as a mm-hmm. founder mm-hmm. in the thick mm-hmm. of it being able to give people good advice point in the right direction just listen just be a sounding board mm-hmm. and then getting the energy from them because as you say you know when when you're a early stage founder it's just a, a freight train yeah. Right, because it can't slow down. Yeah. You know, you just you have no other choice. And, and I think the energy that you can get from that type of mentorship really is um, incredible. Yes. No, it's very enjoyable. I highly recommend it. And and for people I talk to, especially ex corporate people who want to go into the startup world, I just recommend try and get mm. on a mentoring program somewhere because that you, yes, you don't get paid for it in the vast majority of cases, but that's not the point. Um you just meet interesting people, mm. you meet people who are doing things that you'd never dream of doing. So it opens your mind to different types of people with different ambitions, different markets. So you get so much more back than what might seem just sitting down trying to help someone. I, mm. I get a lot more back um, information-wise, and it feeds my curiosity when people start to do new products in new markets. So yeah. I get a lot, a lot back. I, I get a lot more back than maybe the amount of words I use, should we say? Um, but it's very enjoyable. That's one thing. If I if I couldn't do that, I think it would change everything. It's it's uh, it's, it's a very nice part of the part of the week should we say yeah absolutely and out of interest when you're mm. speaking to a, a corporate mm. um how does that conversation go when you're like look you need to learn from startups and they're thinking well we are turning over a couple billion a yeah. year whatever it might be what does that what does that conversation look like i think that conversation's changed since covid i okay. think i think you know we've, we've always been very lucky at progressive and before that we've, we've had clients and and the clients have kept with us I think what we always, the wall we always, the, the, the problem you're always going to get as a founder is is meeting the right person in the corporate. Yeah. Trying to meet the right person who can help you is the biggest thing. And there's no there's no kind of um, right answer here. So you could meet someone who's got a certain job title in one company who's perfect for what you're we're doing and someone could have the same job title in another company mm. and they're not the right person. So it's a bit of luck to get the right person. So we most of, if not all of our new businesses come from recommendations. Um, but it's it's just shown a bit of empathy and hopefully even though I've been out in the corporate world now for some time I've still mo- I've worked longer in the corporate world than I haven't mm-hmm. um, and it's just opening their eyes in a nice way to another opportunity I think there's a danger sometimes that especially from my background in brands that you're so busy that you may rely too much maybe on agencies who will provide you with an overview of what's out there but they're so busy so they don't always have that sight that line of sight for what, what's coming up in the, in the startup world so it's opening people's minds, and that's where our horizon scans are quite good. Mm. So before you start jumping in with a startup and signing up to it, we do quite in-depth horizon scans to mm. show um, corporate clients the art of the possible, what's out there, what people are doing, and where the trends and the investment's going. So they can take that away and think, okay, yes, we're going to we're going to engage. Mm. Some clients are very straight away they come in. I think I think where it's changed since COVID, I think I would argue a lot of corporates pre-COVID could hide behind status quo. Yep, and say we're, we're fine innovation's good and we know what's happening and things are fine I'm comfortable in my job things are fine 
I think since then, I, for many reasons, people realise that they've got to shake up a little bit and, and look at new things. I think there's more pressure from above now to to get that new kind of competitive advantage, which can come from new innovation. So I think I think we've definitely seen an uplift since COVID of more curious corporate new corporate clients coming to us saying, right, okay, let's have a chat. Super interesting. Mm. And, and with everything going on in the world, although I could have said that at any point in the last yeah. two years, right? Mm. Um, do you find that corporates are still willing to invest in that? Has it become deprioritized for them based on, you know, f- tighter economic environment or are they still actually now that this is a priority? I, it depends. That, that it really depends on the corporate. I, th- I think now there is... I've always said there's two things. I've I, we, We've done 100 plus briefs with corporates. So if, if I was to kind of look at trends, there's definitely a a trend. If we have a pitch day where mm-hmm. the startups will come, say there's five startups that are in the final list for this brief, and they will present to the corporate. If we get the, 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 the brand, the corporate person, away from their office and in a separate space, that's very eye-opening for mm-hmm. corporates because they're, out, they're outside their space. It, it's something new. And also, there's still this pleasant surprise from a lot of corporate people that startups aren't acne ridden 18 year olds <laughs> coding in bedrooms, which I still find amazing. <laughs> but they still think, oh my goodness, that's amazing. That person's got 15 years' experience here, or this person's got that. And right. I didn't know we realized we knew someone between, they know the same person I do. It's just like they, some of them, and I understand because in the corporate world, you, you can be very closed in on yeah. what you're doing, and years go by. But they, they're surprised that there's an amount of experience and opportunity. But meeting a startup has a massive impact. We can talk mm. to the cows come home, but once we find a corporate meets a startup, or dare I say goes to a startup event, and they see how professional it is, and it's very, it's, 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 it's credible, yep. you'll be amazed how the light goes on. And we've found with the vast majority of our clients, that once they do one pilot with a startup, then they want to do another one, mm. and then there's another one. Mm. It, it's a bit like no one, no one died, the world didn't collapse. Actually, you know what? It was de-risked. We de-risked it, and it's really good. Yeah, and it and it just like that gave me my oomph when I first met startups. I actually think, in a way, working with startups is most likely the second best option for maybe corporate people who, who want some new excitement, something interesting. Now, I'm, I'm that might sound a bit patronising, but no, no, no. I do at all. think it's we do get a lot of really positive feedback from clients, and that was amazing. I loved all five of them. Yeah. We want to go with that one, and I found they're fascinating what they're doing here, and it's like wow, the, the we, we're in it all the time, so I know yeah. <laughs> how great startup founders are. Um, but it's really nice to see the positive impact they have on on people who are in the corporate world. Generally. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that I have seen time and time again now is people really wanting to start to explore a portfolio career. You know, mm. as, a, oh, as a, you know what I mean. As, yeah. as soon as they, they've spent a long time in corporate and they've loved it, they've built great careers. They've they've you know hopefully made a good bit of money for mm. themselves. But then it's like, okay, they want to give back. They want to get involved with something which is a bit more vibrant, a bit more yeah. dynamic, and um, potentially an opportunity to bring in different types of risk into the way that they're monetizing their time. Yes. You know, maybe taking some sweat equity uh, into mm-hmm. an early stage startup, maybe getting paid as a fractional, you know, advisor, something like that. But I, I definitely think that the approach to work has changed um, forever post-COVID. Yeah. And we're not going to go back to rigid, this is my full-time job forever and it's nine to five. Fully agree. Fractional is another word that's yeah. come about in the last six months, you or so. That's yeah. a, um, yes, absolutely right. I think I think there's more opportunity. Portfolio career now is, is, is out there. Mm-hmm. I meet quite a lot of corporates or people socially who are working in the corporate world and they've got side hustles on and you think wow they never would have had that before yeah. um, whether they whether they kind of make the jump and give their job up to make that a full-time thing is another thing but they've mm. still got other things on whereas i think before not too long ago it was work life mm. and that was it but they didn't realize you could break your work life up a little bit and i know if it exists still now but you could break up your work package a bit more mm. and a lot of corporate Companies now, I think, are, are giving people more flexibility to to look into other things. And I think with the way of working now, with people working from home more, I just think there's more. If you if you if you, I always say, if you've got your head up looking around, you see opportunity. Yeah. If you keep your head down looking at your laptop, you won't. So it's kind of you know, there's lots of stuff out there you can do, which is you know doesn't affect your your, your career, mm. but it's just something interesting to talk about and get yeah. your head into. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think um, from what I've seen with corporates that I've spoken to, one of their huge realizations over the last Mm. bit of time is for them to attract and retain the new wave of talent coming through, Mm. 
offering something a bit more flexible, something a bit more hybrid is a guarantee. You know, the, the stats coming out, I think, I can't remember who did this, um, so conveniently, I can't remember who did this survey, yeah. but it was something, and this may have been about a year ago, but uh, Gen Z talent would rather get paid 10K less a yeah. year yeah. than having to work in the office five days a week. Yeah, I, I, I can believe that. I think it's different, I, I do think it's a different, since COVID, especially, I think it's a different world now. It's mm. good, I think it's really good. I, th I think people should have more say over what they want from work. In my day, you know, you 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 had job options. You just pick one, and and you knew what it was. It was in the office all the time, um, and that was changing even before I left the corporate mm. world. That was slowly, you know, working from home because of technology was a big breakthrough. Mm. But I think it's really good. I think people now should look at more what they. I'm not a, 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 a career advisor, but I do say to my my daughters, you know, think carefully what you want to do and 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 you know, what you want from it. Yeah, you know, and how you want to do it. Yeah, you know, kind of like, do you want to work from home or do this? Because you've got more option now, which sometimes can be very, you can get taken over by all these different choices and options. But, you know, it's a unique time. So think without putting too much pressure on them. Think carefully about what you want and go for something um, as much as you can on your terms rather than just say it's a job and I take it and that keep me through to retirement, mm. which was maybe the old way of thinking. Mm. It, it's really interesting because I think from a founder perspective, Launched my first company in 2013. We were acquired 2018. So, well, you know, pr well, yeah. pre any yeah. hybrid remote working. Yeah. And it was, we were in the office five days a week. Mm. Me and my co-founder, six, seven times a week. Mm. And we were totally bootstrapped at the start, you know, for the first year because out of network, didn't have mm. anything other than mm. our MVP, mm. which we got some good traction on. But we were uh, in a basement underneath a Papa John's. Um, mm. there, was a, there was a window. There was a window, however, it was looking out into a brick wall. Um, yep. And it was freezing the whole time. Yeah. And it was it was, it was was horrible. But we built a real siege mentality mm. as a business. You know, us against the world. We were in there, basement, laptops, getting things done, working crazy hours because we, we were a, a B2C sports content creation platform, sports and gaming content creation platform. And conveniently, I think like 50% of our users were US, 30% UK, 20% Australia. So it was, mm. yeah, a really nice, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. sleep, sleepless period of time. Um, if you had said to me at that point that I would now have a remote first company where some people are in, you know, every three months, mm. we have teams globally, um, at the stage that we had them, I would have thought it was unthinkable. And yeah. I still do. I still do wonder at times the impact of the culture there. We have such a strong culture at Connected, but it's a very different type of culture yeah. than the one we had with that. Everyone's in together alongside each other. What have you seen? See, I, I think that the hybrid approach is perfect, but I, th I think if you go too far either way, I don't think that's good. So I think the old five days in the office, I fully get into. I was part of that, so I understand yeah. that, and you got used to that, um, but. Over time, you start thinking, I don't need to be there five days because of technology and, mm -hmm. and things like COVID and everything accelerated that. I still think if you go further the other way and you actually have a siege mentality in your own house. Yeah. Um, I know during COVID, me personally, I, I was going mad. I mean, mm. my wife was saying, you've got to go for a walk. I mean, I was like a dog. I had to be walked. <laughs> and, I was, and it made me realise how I needed interaction with people. And there was a co-working space uh, in the town I live in. I didn't even know it existed. So mm. I, I would pay £10 a day to sit in this co-working space. I was the only one there mm. just to be in a different location to do some work and say hello to the chap who owned it. We had our masks on and everything. And, but that, that was, you know, I must say he said hello to five people on the way down there, but that was five people more than normal. So I, I, I think it's a, I personally, I think people still need to interact with social animals. And I think it's really good if you've got a job, but there's still that physical get together mm. at some point. I do, I do believe that's very good for you. Um, I, I do quite a few talks at universities um, around the book and starting businesses and everything. And I think there's definitely a, a theme where a lot of people who are studying and want to be founders afterwards think they can do it from the laptop and mm. run a business solely from the laptop, which I think you can in certain areas, but generally I just don't know if it's that easy. So there's this kind of theory that you, you can go onto LinkedIn and you can send out 500 messages to, or, or pitches to people and you get some business do it all from your laptop or wherever you want to be on your laptop And but it isn't like that people no. get fed up with you've got to go out and meet people and I, the biggest thing I say to people is you've got to as much as you can try and network physical networking events and just meet people as well as making the most of technology and being at home when you can mm -hmm. be and catching up so I, I do think you need both um, 
and I always say to my daughters, without saying like a, like a typical father, I say, you know, do get out and meet people because COVID was a bit awful time, you know, for the world. Technology saved the day with with Zoom calls and Microsoft Teams and Google and everything. But I don't know about everyone else, but I got I got really fed up with off on one call onto oh, another. Yeah. I think my eyesight went downhill. Everything I, I was. You could spend a day speaking to loads of people all around the world, but you just sat in a chair. Yeah, it was brutal. Yeah, and really some was. people loved that. Some people think I could do that, but I, I, I personally needed that interaction with people. Mm. So the hybrid approach is perfect. I was doing it almost before COVID anyway, yeah. but I think that's just right. But I think you need both. You need that time on your own to focus and get things done that you can do from home mm. um, and have a few calls. But I do think it's good to get out, get some fresh air, meet people. Absolutely. As you said, we are uh, a species that requires social connection yes, in order to function. Change, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting because I think uh, we do live in a world, especially for the younger generation, where social connection has been confused with connections on social. Yes. Right? You know, right, and yeah. it's a very, very different thing. And yeah, one yeah. does not replace the other. Um, but one question I have, because I totally agree with you on the you know, fallacy of the digital nomad founder mm -hmm. scaling to a unicorn, right? It just doesn't yeah. happen, right? Yeah. I love the idea of being yeah. able to be pitched up on a beach in Bali running my company, but yeah. it's not reality. Yeah. You know, may maybe pre-product, pre-revenue, you've got three devs around the world, then you can probably do yeah. that remotely for yeah. a bit. Yeah. But yes, once you're into reality and, and traction yeah. and, and growth, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So yeah. what are other reality checks that founders need to hear? When working, well, when building their business. Yeah, in general. I think one is having, well, what, one I say, and again, this may be a show my age, one is just being the basics of being on time and delivering what you say you're going to do, mm -hmm. when you're going to do it. I, I always joke that nowadays there's always a, things always slightly late or people turn up slightly late and things like that. And having sat in loads of pitch sessions um, where there's my clients on one side and startups will come in and pitch on the other. If someone said to me now, what's the biggest uh, reason why the startup that should have won the business didn't get it, it's it's either because they are slightly late for the meeting or when they pitch, they over-pitch. So they don't keep to the timings of the session. So if the session's 15-minute pitch, 15-minute Q&A, they will pitch 25 minutes. And people who know me say, Ken's always going on about keeping times. But because we're, we're being British very polite. Mm -hmm. So you will over-pitch, people say, that was fantastic, you'll leave the room going, it's amazing, I've got that gig, it's going to be great. And then I go back and the client goes, they couldn't keep the time, everyone else did. If they or they were late, if they can't keep the time for this kind of meeting, what are they going to be like when we're working with them and my job's on the line? That's it. So it's a simple thing. So the housekeeping of just, uh, it's an unfortunate thing, but I do think if you turn up on time nowadays and you keep the time and you deliver what you say on time, you will come across as super efficient. Been 20 years ago, it'd been, well, that's what we're paying you for. So slightly controversial, but that's what I see there. So one is just keep your basics tight, be on time, deliver on time. And and, you, and people will give you space if things don't quite go right after that. You can say, oh, and they say, oh, no, so and so is a good person. If they're going to be a day late, we give them a day. As long as you let people know. Um, I think the other thing is just be realistic, both sides of what how you're seen. So if you're a, a startup, a founder, going to see a corporate, some founders will think this is the million-dollar check. This is going to, If this goes well, this is me working now for Coke or adidas or someone. And they tell all their friends that they've got a meeting with adidas. So they put all this pressure on themselves that this is going to be the big, groundbreaking day and then even if it all goes right and they get a piece of work Adidas I assume we're not going to turn around and say here is five million pounds <laughs> for some work well, give us your bank details mm -hmm. um, and there's a bit of a shock sometimes it sounds really silly but some sometimes the, the, the brands get in the way the logos get in the way of, of reality from a founder's point of view so I always say yes you could get to that point one day but you're going to start small pilot whatever it may be and you're working with people so you could work for one of the biggest companies in the world, but you might only see four people. Mm. And one of our clients is Procter & Gamble. I know five people in Procter & Gamble. That's it. Procter & Gamble's a huge company. So, but that's it. So you're still, you're a small team. You're working with a small team. So keep it simple. Don't let the brands get in the way in terms of extra pressure and maybe blinding reality. So keep it simple. You're still working with people. So be polite. Turn up on time. Deliver what you say you're going to do. And it works the other way for corporates. I say to corporates, you're not going to meet the new... Snapchat, right. Facebook overnight, and double your revenue because we've introduced the next big thing. Because if we could do that, it'd be amazing. But <laughs> yeah. we're not, you know, no one can do it. It's, it is, there's a lot of luck and everything involved there. So managing both sides a bit like a first date takes a bit of time. That's a lot of what we do is kind of managing expectations throughout the process. Mm. But for founders, just keep it simple, get your pitch right, 
and and just be realistic. It's a, it's a I hate the term journey, but it's more of a it's a it's a journey rather than it's all going to happen straight away. Yeah, no, I think it's really important. And uh, like in sports, play the match, not the occasion. Right, absolutely right, and that's exactly it. And I think sometimes the occasion gets in the way, and mm. and you can see it, and you think, my goodness, you know, it's you can, you can almost see the someone going into a room pitching, and their chance of getting that gig, that brief, or say hundred percent, and then it goes down, and you think he's not going to turn around now. Mm. But no one's going to stand up and say this is awful. This, everyone's pretty polite. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. I I talk about this a lot. But so I did stand up comedy for two years. Wow, that's um, brave. loved it. Great yeah. fun. But there are so many similarities mm. between pitching as a founder yeah. and doing stand up in the same of controlling the room, losing the room, getting the basics right, yeah. knowing your stuff, being able to to read the room. You know, being able to to have empathy and understanding what your audience wants. I mean, I guess it's the same as sales pitches. I guess it's it's pretty similar throughout. And it's not natural to a lot of people. Mm. I'm not a salesperson. It's not natural to pitch something. You have to you have to find your own style. I think reading the room is important, which is very difficult on on Zoom and things yeah. like that. And that's one benefit of face to face. But I, I I think that's the other thing is be. Um, I was there was a, there was a saying at AB InBev about if if you've got a strength, exceed at that. And other things, just be, just be kind of bring the what you're not so good at up to average. Don't try and be amazing. Everything is impossible. Mm. So if you're not so good at presenting, then make sure you're you're you know you're a pretty competent presenter. Not amazing, but just you're comfortable with it. And if you're really really good at something else, then then really excel at that. But as long as you're you're at least you're 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 competent on everything, and you excel at certain things, rather than most people think I've got to be the best at everything, which is impossible. So very interesting. Mm. This takes me onto a. a something which you haven't discussed on this podcast before, so I'm really glad you get to this. Do you ever have to coach founding teams into saying, look, you're better at pitching, you should be doing this? Because often yep. what you have is in co-founding relationships, generosity is the wrong word, but yep. listen, to be a founder, you have to have a certain level of ego and belief in yourself and confidence, right? Mm -hmm. this, this is part of the territory. Mm. Um, I've seen many, many, been very many investment pitches where I'm like, this guy should be doing the whole pitch. This guy should be nowhere near this. Yeah. Um, something you come across? Do you Absolutely. coach? We we well we always when it comes to the the part of the process where the we we go through with the client the the horizon what's out there. So it could be fifty startups. We knock that down to five with them, and then those five will come and pitch. We coach the startups before the pitch day. So it's mm -hmm. at that point we tell them who the client is. And we go into more de detail and brief. We try and keep it very light. It's not like you've got to do a full proposal in the pitch. But we go through certain things with them. Who's going to pitch? We give them some insight. If I was you, I wouldn't mention that. We ask if we can see the, if, if they've got time to show us the pitch date before the day itself. If we know the startup, um, and in a lot of cases we know them already, we, we kind of get a feeling for who should be pitching. But you're exactly right. There is ego involved. And, and people want to be there for this, as I say, this occasion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not always a good thing. I always say, if, you, if you're going to, as much as the right person should pitch, I also think, if you're going to come five of you, make sure you've all got a role to play. Don't just have one person presenting and the other four sit there doing nothing because it's like, well, what, what were the other four here for? It's and a that, strange look. It's a strange look. And then you get people trying to say something just to justify why they're sitting at the end of the row here. So we always say it's best if one or two come, no more than two. You don't want that spare, feel like a spare piece. Um but yes, it's a weird one because I've I've seen founders who are maybe very technically driven, mm -hmm. who know their product inside out, but can't, for want of a better term, sell it, bring it to life. And I've seen a lot of founders employ salespeople mm. who will horrendously destroy the whole thing by selling it very well, and then literally say, right, so we're going to sign today for this kind of deal. You know, it's a good chance. You know, and it's like a hard sell. And I think, well, that just does not work with any of our clients. Who just say, uh, no. <laughs> You know, so if, if, if it was that was easy to close yeah. a corporate, but right? it's very aggressive. So I, I, yeah. I find I don't know about it so much now, but definitely a few years ago there was a kind of a circuit of um, ex salespeople who came in and thought, well, I, could, I can go to it with any founder and sell their stuff, and they were they were they, they again they got taken over by the occasion, and they were sent to oh, some ridiculous situations like mm. we're going to sign this deal now for so and so, we will do it now. If, if you want to give us your signature now, we're doing. I thought, well, that doesn't really fit in this environment. It's going to take a little bit more time than that. And it, it and the, the founders sitting there, in some cases, thinking, "Well, this must be normal," mm. but it isn't. You got to, you know, it doesn't work with the corporate and startup. The hard sell from the startup, sign here or 
I think it doesn't. I've never uh, seen that just, work. Yeah, it's not going to work. That's just not going to happen. But I think that's lack of understanding from yeah. the salesperson coming in thinking they can deliver on anything. So interesting. I, I always think, you know, if you're not a, I guess the ideal, I don't want to say the ideal founder. I think a, a technical founder who can sell yeah. is obviously so impressive. Mm. You know, uh, who can sell really well, who who has a very strong technical um, brain. But I think, um, you know, the, the founding teams that I've invested in that have performed the best, yeah, are, are one technical founder who is nowhere near pitching and presenting and selling. Yeah. And one non-technical founder who's still, you know, technically savvy or, or, or at least, you know, in, inclined mm, mm. Um, that way, but who is just fantastic at sales, marketing, brand, and that side of things. Because I think, you know, often I see teams with um, two commercial founders mm. and, you know, I find that it's often very scrappy over... You know who, who's going to do what? Who should be leading pitches? I, I think yeah. that's often quite a problematic configuration of founding I think, team. I think sometimes it's having the confidence in yourself that you don't have to say too much in this meeting, mm. and just contributing in a subject where you have the expertise. I think there's a some founders think, well, if you're going to get if it's 15 minutes, we're going to have seven or eight minutes each, and I think, well, no. As long as you say, if there's a couple, there's a couple of slides you want to elaborate on, it's your area, then fantastic. But mm-hmm. You don't have to like do alternate slide or you know a lot of people one do word that, each but, yeah. yeah but it's a bit like that well you're saying but well, no, I think at the end of the day it's for the, the good of the company you get the business it doesn't matter who presents yeah um, but generally I'd say the, the, the startups we deal with they kind of know who's going to lead it mm-hmm. and you might ironically get the other situation where someone doesn't want to pitch yeah and they say well so and so can pitch can talk about my bit and I'll come in if there's a question yeah which I think works a lot better than someone wanting to say something for the sake of it. So, mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Okay, there's five questions I ask every guest that I want to go through with you. Okay. The first question is, what is the single biggest risk you've ever taken and what was the outcome? Uh, that's a good question. I'd, I'd say the, the definitely the biggest one was leaving the corporate world. And I look back at that now and it seems a bigger risk now than it did then. It was So in my job, I had to give six months notice mm-hmm. and the my boss was based in Bremen in Germany. So I used to go out there quite a lot. And I decided, I got to a point where I always said in the corporate world, the, the writing was on the wall for me moving to something else. But the wall kept moving away and coming nearer. And before you know it, another two years gone by. And, and I got to a point where I really wanted to be this middle person. I didn't know how. But I also knew myself that if I just kind of played on the side with it, it would never happen. And I just keep working. So in a moment of absolute madness, maybe, I flew out to Bremen as I did, had my normal meeting with my boss, um, and just said, I'm going to resign. And uh, I'm going to start my own business and I'm going to do this. And that's all I had. Didn't have any clients. Didn't even have any idea how I'm going to do it, to be completely honest. But I had to put myself in a corner. Mm. Maybe I knew deep down that in those six months, if things weren't working, I could maybe come and get my job back again. I don't know. I don't know if I ever thought that or not. Maybe subconsciously that was there as a safety net. But yeah, I gave six months notice with no plan apart from the gap that I thought was in the market. And it focused the mind. And as you slowly get taken out of email groups and I had more time. So I gave myself the goal that by the 1st of um, Jan 2014, I would um, have a client, and I did. Um, but the six months there were quite mad. I worked all my time because obviously I needed the, the money up to when I ended. I think my wife, was Katie, was, wasn't was too bad, a bit surprised by me coming back saying, well, I'm not going to get another job, I'm going to start my own job. My mother-in-law was absolutely shocked <laughs> by that. And I also remember my father on the phone and I can read my father's voice for saying, oh, I'm sure you know what you're doing. But in a way, which is, what are you doing? <laughs> but in a funny way, that spurred me on. I think I'm a, there's a little bit of me, which might be a bad thing sometimes, but the more people say you can't do something, the more I want to kind of prove people wrong. So that may be kicked in. But that was the biggest risk. And and I like think it's not really well, you know, where we are now. And I'm glad I took it. If I hadn't have taken it, I think I would have been at the company for another year. And mm. I may have gone into another marketing job. But marketing's a young person's game. And... Mm. I think it's a bit like a football manager. You kind of start at a top club and then over time you go down or a football player. Mm. You, 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 so you end up captaining a non-league team, but you used to play for a good team. And I yeah. think marketing's a bit like that. So I could have kept in the marketing world and by now I might have had a very good title, but it had been in the company that makes Tarling somewhere or something, mm. for some regional part of the UK. So I, th- I think it was the right time to go. But if you'd have said to me two years before I jumped or a year before I jumped that I'd be working for myself, I'd have said there's no way on this earth. Really? Oh, God, yeah, no way. No way on this earth. So it entered the mind and then you made the jump quick. Yeah. I, I yeah. never, I like the corporate world for stability. You had the status. 
all the things like the company car, the shares. I enjoyed yeah. that. Um, but then once this came up, it just felt, it sounds a bit naff, say, calling, but no, it, it was I, a bit like, oh, why don't I do it? And the more people said, you must be mad. I thought, you know what, maybe I'll do it. <laughs> I love that. That's said like a true yeah. founder for sure. Yeah. Oh, well. And and I think um, I've always been like this as well. And it's interesting. A lot of people I speak to, especially younger generation, have a very different mindset mm. around this. But being all in, so important, right? And, and I, I get exactly what you mean by realizing that, okay, if I stay here, I'm never going to take this seriously enough to make it what it needs to be. And I wouldn't have done. Yeah, I would still be talking about this now at yeah. another corporate. Like I've got this little side hustle where I help startups and corporates for free get together. Yeah. I'm going to do it one day. But then the other people are doing it. And I've been thinking, what have I done? But I still must. I would have carried on. Yeah, yeah. For the day I died, that this little side thing was going on. Yeah, hundred so, percent. So yeah, I knew I knew I had to put myself in a quite a stressful situation for it to move. Love that. Okay, uh, what are you proudest of? Um, well, it's normal things. I'd say fan me and everything. I'm very proud of that. That's an obvious answer, maybe. But I, I would say I'm proud of making that jump. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of sticking with it. And I don't mean I ever wanted to go back on 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 you know, back into you know, to ABI, ABI and back into a branding life again. But I think sometimes as a founder, you you hit, you go up and down, and that's part of the fun. But you sometimes take knocks. I think I've I've discovered myself a lot more. If that makes sense. Being a, a, a entrepreneur and and i think i'm proud that not only have i kind of carried on and and things have happened and they've gone really well but also that along the way i've done things i never thought i'd do like write a book mm -hmm. we did a i don't know three series of podcast series you know and that was i never thought i'd do that but these were things i looked at and thought i want to do a podcast series well why don't i just do it and i like the well what do i need to get a microphone and i need to do this and and the book it was like well, i'm going to write a book who am i going to do it with how do i do it what, what publishers are out there so I think it's taught me to be confident to take a step into the unknown, but also, um, and maybe it comes back to the networking, of actually I enjoy finding people who, to get information from to decide how to do it. Mm. I wouldn't just, I couldn't just do it from online, you know, do a chat bot, someone, someone to start a book, yeah, fill this in, done. I said, I have to meet people and talk about what, what I want to do. So I'm proud that I've kept momentum going and I'm proud that along the way I've, I've achieved things with the book, the podcast and the business. And and I'm you know I, I enjoy the I said a mentoring side and just an it's an unusual answer but I would say I've built quite a nice network of people I know and I help and hopefully they help me and I think that I didn't add zero mm. you know, I don't think people necessarily network in the corporate world they network with people like themselves within the closed circles of the corporate world but mm. I think they're meeting new people fresh people I, I didn't do at all so I'm I'm I'm, I'm pleased that. That's really helped me, yeah. From a business and a and a mental perspective. So, just re I find that really invigorating. Yeah, nice, nice. That's fantastic, and it's great advice as well. Because I think sometimes as a founder, as you just said there, you know, you you need to and you can build your own momentum. Yeah. You know, by throwing yourself into new projects, into networking, finding things like no one's coming to save you, right? You got to make it happen for yourself. Well, day one of starting for myself, I was down the road just off the roundabout, and I had a flask mm -hmm. of coffee. I'd made my own sandwiches because I wanted to cut back on money. And I sat there with my laptop, brand new Apple Mac laptop, never had one before. Yeah. I thought, I've got my own business now. It's fantastic. <laughs> and I, I had one client that I had two, it was two weeks before I saw them. Mm -hmm. So I had two weeks to be a, what am I going to do? And it's amazing after an hour, I thought, well, this is a little bit dull. So I, I started kind of saying, I'll catch up. And I met people for coffee and that was it. Meet people, yeah. talk about things. And I just made sure I had things in the diary. So you just keep moving. Uh, I, I just can't, if I sit here, if we're, I'm, obviously, I, I stopped buying a flask of coffee as time went on, but yeah. that was it. I must say, looked like a typical first day, first time founder. But I realised quite early on that it's not going to happen magically on my laptop. I've got to go and meet people. A hundred percent. I I think that's some of the best advice that you can have as a as a founder. It's literally about that. It's about just keep on throwing as much as possible out there. Tell people what you're doing mm. because probably what you start with is not going to be what you have within six months no. in startup land. But that process that dialectic process yeah. of you know ideas smashing together and optimization iteration is only going to happen from getting out there pr try yeah. to make pre-sales pre-partnerships waiting all of those things and it's all it's, and i think there's a danger sometimes of, again i'm not saying the younger network but generally people think networks but networking is all about meeting the right person who can help you but it isn't always mm. that. it's meeting someone who knows someone who knows someone that can help you or help other people dare i say yeah. um but it's just getting out there and, and you get fine-tuned on what to say and also 
quite quickly what is a good and a bad event to stay at. That, that's yep. de- I'm definitely got a sixth sense now for I'm going to have one drink here and I'm off. Yeah. Or and I'm staying here. It's got a good feeling, and that comes with time and experience. But the networking I find is a really good reset as well. Just going out and meeting people. Mm. I, I do find the confines of a, a laptop and a room. If if you've had a you know a challenge in two or three days, they can be quite soul destroying. Just sitting yeah. there, and it get quite, I say a first time founder is quite lonely. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. I you got to realize there's other better. founders out there. Like yeah, you. I was gonna say I don't think it gets much better the second time either. No, um, but but yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Okay, my next one for you yep. is: Is there anything you wish you did differently? I think I would have when I first started. I was I was out networking with people I, I i think if i could have done something differently i would have enjoyed the moment more mm. i because of what i was doing this sounds a bit weird but i think it took me about 18 months to realize that i was working for myself because in my previous corporate job i would still get trains into london i would still go into offices and present to people i would still be chatting as i was at the start of my own business with marketing people mm. so my brain I think, thought that this is business as usual, even though it sounds really weird. So I, I didn't really, every now, I didn't realise I appreciate the opportunity I had. Even though I was working as an entrepreneur and I was building a business and I was doing all these scary things, I, I think part of my brain was still thinking this is business as normal. So I don't, I don't think I really, not grabbed the moment, but I had to keep reminding myself that I've done something quite big here mm. and I'm working for myself and, and, and this is great. I think I just got into right another meeting, get a train back, come in and... Yes, it got things done. I'm not mm. changing any of that. But I think mentally I could have opened up a bit more and thought, this is really great. Mm. I think I just got straight into hard work, head down. Yeah. And I think I could have appreciated more. I appreciate it a hell of a lot more now, mm. and I have done in the last few years. But I just think at the start I didn't I didn't open my mind as much. Even though on the, on the outset people would look at me and think, oh, Ken's out and about chatting to people. I think mentally I still thought I was doing a job mm. for someone. Well, it's, it's a really, really interesting answer because I think um, at the start, I can only talk about my own experience here, but when you're at the start of a new business, sometimes it's it can actually be so daunting and it can be so existential at times in terms of, okay, well, what if this doesn't work in six months' time? Yeah. Sometimes it's, or I, at least I have found it, actually going a bit more narrow, a bit more tunnel-focused, yeah. actually is exactly what you need to do to be able to you know get shit done in that way. Yeah. Well, I think if I'd have, say, opened up a florist or something like that it would have been yeah. this is a new world i've got a shop i've got this that would have been wow yeah and it'd been tough and i still would have had to focus but i think i would have been aligned with the situation more because it's completely different i i, mm. I, I, I don't know if it's a regret i just think mm. look back i think i got kind of sucked into the the habit mm. of into london presenting yeah so it didn't feel that different at the start, which maybe helped yeah. in the long run. It's really interesting. So I've been keeping, um, so it's a Word doc synced between my phone and my laptop, of course, uh, which I've been keeping since June 2015. Wow. And it's literally a daily, my to-do list, you know, including my meetings, th- like just things that I need to get done, ADHD. So if it doesn't go on there, it doesn't happen, yeah, right? Yeah. It's a coping mechanism more than anything. But whenever I'm having like a, a bad day or a challenging day, yeah. I'll literally flip back where was I this day last year and the year before and the year before. Mm. And although at, in that moment I may have not been present or being mindful about what's going on, as a benchmark for myself to be like, okay, yeah. actually, there's been a lot that's, you know, gone yeah. right. And yeah. no, I think that's, Well, during COVID, I, I, I'm quite a reader. I read quite a lot, but I, I think it was just before COVID, maybe I, I had a blue book and I wrote any kind of positive quotes or things I liked mm. in this blue book. And the blue book's almost full up now. It's a small little handbook thing. And, you know, if you have those moments sometimes, where I always have to, I haven't got to hand today, but I use it with hand. I just open a page up. Yeah. And there's a quote or, or a paragraph that I like from a book. And it and I always put the date next to when I wrote it. So a bit like mm-hmm. yourself, oh, I wrote that four years ago. And four years ago, it had just been before COVID. And mm. So maybe it just takes you out of the moment and makes you realise that, you know, there's a bigger picture here than the, path that you're going along yeah rather than everything is about here and now yeah exactly and i think it's so important to um you know discuss these things because you know young founders listen to this um you know obviously you've been incredibly successful just you know your company's just been acquired which is amazing um but to hear that everyone has to sometimes remind themselves of you know good yeah. things and nice things and we all go through that that founder journey is uh, is really important i think i think that's the main thing i think it is um, I was at an event the other day where I forget the name of the company. I should remember who had it, but it was more for solo founders to meet. Mm-hmm. And and I went along because I knew one of the people who were arranging it. 
And one of the reasons they, they run these events is to make solo founders realise that there are other solo founders out there. So if you're having a bad day, you, it's not unusual mm -hmm. to have a bad day. And because you, it's very easy to read, read good things. So and so's double this, and they've been acquired. All this, it's amazing startups. And people watch the the Facebook film when it came out all those years ago. It's pizza yeah. and beer, and it's amazing <laughs> life. And you you kind of think, is that what it's like? But it's not. Mm. You know, and I, I do think again, it goes back to going out and meeting people because you're talk to other people, and, and hopefully, I do find entrepreneurs and the network is much more honest mm. and much more helpful than what I would say is the old corporate network. So people keep their strategies to themselves, and the startup world's much more. Well, you know, if we can't do it, I introduce you to someone who runs a competition who can help you with it, and that, and it's mm. much more open. I was taken aback by that, but yeah, I do, I do fully get. Where you, you've got to realize it's not just you. And there are other people out there who can who you can you can have a drink with and think actually it's not too bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But that. we all we all have that. But yes. I, I think it's it's just important to it's not it, it'd be unusual if you'd had amazing day after amazing day. I'd say well something's not, not quite right here. <laughs> Maybe you're the founder yeah. of delusion's gone too far. Then absolutely right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, my second to last question for yep. you is: What does it take to be successful? Um, well, the obvious answer is hard work. It's not easy. I keep saying keep talking about my children to my children that if it seems too good to be true it usually is and everything takes hard work what you think is a, a, a great deal it takes hard work to get it and if it, sit, it looks like it's sitting on a plate for you it takes hard work so hard work resilience is is one i think the other one i've 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 thought about a lot in the last seven or eight years is just self-awareness mm. um i've read quite a look on i think it's ryan holiday and his stoic books and things yep. like that I, I find those quite um useful in terms of being aware of what you can and can't control, it's very difficult to, to, to be completely linear and everything in that, but that is a good thing, and actually seeing the bigger picture um, and appreciating the moment more um, in terms of literally this is where we are, this is you know, it's great being here, having a chat, that kind of thing. So I think being self-aware is quite important. So I now know that I definitely have certain times of the day where I'm, um, and this was the same in the corporate world. So when I used to be a brand guy, if I look at any creative in the morning, I used to look at it and go, this is great, do that. If I look at it past four, half four, it was like, this is awful. <laughs> Send it back. So interesting. And the next day I get up and go, that's amazing. <laughs> Why did I? So in a bizarre way, I think, my if anything creative, I, I generally don't leave it to the end of the day. I'm, I'm, my brain's getting tired and you see things in, in the wrong way. Um, and I also feel that, like most people, if you wake up in the middle of the night and, I mean, my brain can look at the best day coming up and turn it into hell. And I just have another voice now in my head which is oh, it's just your usual kind of middle of the night voice. Mm. just go back to sleep you do and the next day things are fine so I think it's seeing it's almost um, and someone wrote a book about it I think called Chatter or something about the inner voices in your head as a okay. get the name of the book but it's a very good book but it's just seeing understanding your thought process and emotions from the outside almost so I'm just going through one of my you know, I need a mm. coffee or, or it's the middle of the night that's why I'm a bit fed up it's nothing it'll be fine in the morning mm. um, so it's being more self aware of your, your, your ups and downs in yourself yeah. And how you see things, yeah. Um, I think that's been a great help, and I've definitely become more, much more self-aware working for myself because sometimes at the start, especially, it's just you and the voice in your head. There's no one to point fingers at, right? And there's no one to bounce <laughs> stuff off. You can go home about, but you just literally a lot going on up there. So you just got to kind of think, okay, what is happening here? Mm. And what is it all bad, all good, and mm. that kind of thing. So yeah, so I say self-awareness, hard work, um, and and another thing maybe goes back to the reading, but I think being curious is quite a good thing. I think it's quite nice to be curious about things, try something new. I'm not talking about some people go hand gliding or, you know, I'm not talking, nothing like that, but, you know, just, just seeing new things, finding out about new things and outside of work even, just 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 freshens your brain up. I was reading a, listening to a podcast yesterday where I think these surgeons, I think it was surgeons or professors or something, were, if they ever hit a brick wall with something, they would, they would go and watch a action film or something. And it'd be so different from their day job that by the time they finished the action film, whatever that film was, that problem wasn't a problem. They solved it. So it's a bit like sleep helps you, but some, yeah. so going for a walk. So I think, I think I'm quite into um, having different interests. I can read a book if I need to for ten minutes. I can listen to a bit of music. Those little bits you can get. Those those little um, areas you can go to just to get you out the mm. the blockage of the mental blockage of oh, I'm not getting anywhere with this. Yeah. So yeah. I'm always putting bits of music on or watching bits of films then come back to the work yeah i love that it's an amazing answer i think people forget that brains are computers and there's a mm. lot of background processing power and genuinely take take a problem go away there is a 
you there may is some, there is some there's yeah. some science to it i think yeah, yeah. absolutely you know, yeah. your your conscious may no longer be focused on that problem mm. but the subconscious is still working away at it yeah. even if you don't know and um i i, I it's the, it's the reason why you go back to something and you can see it with fresh eyes or, or actually you've come much closer to solving it than before because it it's continued to being worked on yeah i had this analogy or something recently on holiday where if you get an email or a phone call or something and it, it feels quite negative, there is an instant you want to respond, not yes. aggressively, but you think, oh, what about this? Sometimes maybe aggressively. Yeah, sometimes Depends. maybe. <laughs> uh, or, you, or your brain goes down a certain path. And I always think of it, and this is not a great analogy, but I almost think of it like an old kind of seesaw where the, mm. the weight of the email or the, the, the phone is weighing down the seesaw up this way. Mm-hmm. So that's all the weight of the negativity is there. And that's what happens when you first get the email, you first get the call, you think, oh, it's all bad. and Yeah. I'd say just let it balance up. So don't get back. And then literally within half an hour, an hour, yep. I find it's all that, that weight's gone mm-hmm. and it's, it's all weighed up again. You see it much more, excuse the pun, balanced. Mm. So I, I always have this kind of 30 minute period where I think, well, I'm, that's what I think at the moment. But I, I'll take the dog for a walk or, yep. or I'll have a chat with someone. And then I come back and look at it. And my brain's thought, actually, no, they didn't mean that. They mm. meant this or this is what they want. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It's my, uh, my dad's dad was in the army and his general commander someone i don't really know mm-hmm. army hierarchy that well always said to him nothing is ever as good or as bad as it first seems oh god yeah. and it, that's always something which i've and kept time in moves mind. so quickly that what you thought was huge huge thing mm. wasn't anything at all and it's three months ago now yeah exactly but it, it gets back to the self-awareness point mm-hmm. before i ask mm-hmm. the last question because it's a really really interesting one when you realize that we are not our thoughts Yes, and, absolutely right. and, yeah, yeah. and it's a really strange concept when you first think about that because you know with the, the inside voice with the chatter as you say you know you you get so used to believing that, that is how you think mm. but you know i don't want to go existential here but it makes like, what is real what is not who are we yeah right if not our thoughts but yeah. um that, that probably a, a bigger subject for another time right maybe <laughs> no but it's a good point i think it is this we all have this inner voice and generally i think i've read that inner voice is generally negative mm. Because it's a survival thing, um, mm. keeps you on your toes. If I remember what I've read before, so it's a natural thing, um, but you don't want it, you don't want it to kind of become the voice. Mm. But it is weird when you think about you got to ignore what your brain's saying because then you get yeah. people who say you should go by your gut, and, yeah. which is very important. Yeah, but there's different there. So it's a, it's quite a deep subject. But I'm, I'm I'm quite into I'm intrigued by how that that works. But to your point earlier I, i've never ever has anything been as bad or as good as i thought it would be yeah you should have never as bad yeah, yeah yeah nothing's ever gone especially with work nothing's ever gone as bad as you thought you always blow it up and something works out mm. or it's not as bad as you thought or you misread the situation at the start mm. but the, the scary one is for me time you go through this and it's everything and then a month two months go by and you think not only it wasn't that as big as i thought it was but it's like in the past it's just yeah. moved on so Time is a big, they say time's a big healer, but I think also the way we think, time just drags you into something else. Mm. And, you know. Yeah, for sure. And I, I also, I, I really believe that um, the worst moments in our lives will end up being the best moments mm. Uh, mm. because they're normally new opportunities. It's normally the end of something. Yep. And it's normally a new opportunity for something new. Absolutely right. Although we only see that in hindsight. Yeah, and at the time it's tough. Okay, we could do this for another hour, I'm sure. Yeah. But my last question for you yeah. is, 15-year-old Ken walks in the room. What are you going to tell him? I don't know if I'd recognise him, but um, I would. Yeah, fifteen's a difficult age. I, I wouldn't want people to know everything at fifteen, but I, w- I would say maybe work harder at school. Took me a bit of time to catch up with that side of things. I'm glad I did, but um, work a bit harder. I'd say um, without, because fifteen you don't really think too much about the future, but just mm-hmm. to have a think about what you you enjoy and what you don't enjoy. I think when you're 15, you kind of free will a bit, and before you know, you're 20, 25, and you think, I don't know what I want to do and where I am and what's good and bad. So you might have a skill or talent, and it doesn't have to be a musician or a, a scientist or whatever. It could be something you're just very good at. It could be getting on with people. It could be something. Just just think about what makes you different in a good way, even at 15. And I'm always trying to say to my daughter, you know, you're really good at that. You've got, a, you've got a talent there, whether you take it up or not, but you've got an eye for that. And I think they're older now, but I think when you're 15... You just go with the flow. Mm. I did. I definitely went with the flow. And I should have jumped off that. Um, educationally, what I had to pull my socks up a bit. But I think definitely work harder. Um, think a bit about yourself and what you're good at and what you enjoy. And I think on the back of that, the third thing I'd say is 
I wish I'd have read more when I was younger. Mm. Not, not. I mean, I read quite a lot now, but whatever. There's no right and wrong with what you read, but just open your mind a bit. I think. I think I, I used to live. My parents live in Ryslip on the outside of London yep. on the Met Line, and if I lived there now as a fifteen year old, I'd be into London all the time and everything. Maybe mm. not as fifteen. I don't know. Maybe do it at that age now, but. But you just, I may as well have been in a small village called Ryslip that was 300 miles away because you just, you just stayed where you were, you kept your same amount of friends. And I think part of that is because you didn't have social media then, you didn't, all you only have was TV and what people spoke about and what was on the news, if you ever watched the news. So you're quite closeted. I think nowadays, especially, or even, you know, if, if go back to when I was 15, if I'd have read a bit more and taken an interest in other things, I think one would have been really good for me mentally, but it might have opened my eyes to slightly the bigger picture. Mm. I think reading is a really good thing that I do a lot of now and I don't regret not reading when I was younger but if I could change one thing I think it doesn't have to be a classic or anything whatever you want to read just have a read cause it's very good for your, your brain and it just opens your eyes to things and I, I do believe the more you read or the more people you see you, you create dots mm -hmm. in a way and then the more you do those dots join but if you don't create all these interests and dots and people you're never going to join the dots because there's no dots there to join so I, I think the more you do the more you read the more you're intrigued by curious by I think I think you you see opportunity better, and I think that's what I would say to a fifteen year old me is, it's what's happening at the moment in the news, or or what what you're interested in, or what, just why don't you ever read of that? And that's quite interesting. But fifteen year old me wouldn't have done that. <laughs> Ken, amazing advice. Where can people find you? Uh, the best place LinkedIn. So I'm on. That's not an unusual answer. I say if you're on LinkedIn, more than happy to connect up with people. I'm always happy to have a chat with people. The vast majority of my conversations come from a LinkedIn connection. So feel free to connect up on on LinkedIn. Ken, you're a legend. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. Thanks for watching the episode. And if you haven't subscribed, please hit subscribe below so that you can support the podcast and we can keep on bringing you amazing new guests. If you want to see the other amazing episodes in this podcast, click into our series section. As ever, if there are any other guests or topics you want us to explore, just let me know in the comments and we'll do our best to bring someone in.